So Yael was talking about the fact that today we're sort of dissecting and looking at different aspects of women in leadership. And I'm going to call him an honorary woman for the day, so unfortunately he is a man. Howard Schultz of Starbucks said something that really resonated with me, which is the currency of great leadership is transparency and truth. Transparency and truth. So if you can't be transparent and honest about your own personal leadership story in the middle of Times Square, I don't know where you can. And frankly, there is nowhere to hide. I can't run off this stage. There's just a lot of traffic around here. So it's just me and you for the next few minutes. So when I reflect on my personal story, there are three themes that really stand out that I wanted to share with you a little bit. And if any of this resonates with you or with people you know, with people that you work with, with members of your family or neighbourhoods, please share it with them because there's no point me standing here sharing about me if unless it is in some way useful and you can share it with people that you know. Um, the three things that really jump out at me in my story are fear, risk and failure. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fear, risk and failure. Most people will stand up and give you sort of like the good news story about everything that they've done that is amazingly successful. I'm going to sort of flip that on its head a little bit and just explain that because I've embraced fear, risk and failure, I am the happiest person I know. I have the best life, I'm completely fulfilled, I love my cat, I love my husband, I love my curious eight-year-old, I travel Civil War battlefields with him because that's what he's into, why not? So risk, failure um, and fear have led me to happiness. So if that resonates with any of you, then you can do the same thing too. And I'm going to share how I deal with fear, how I feast on failure and how the F word is not a bad word, not that one anyway and how the ROI on risk is actually much bigger and better than you could ever imagine. And the whole thing starts with fear. Is anyone out there an introvert? Would anyone say they're an introvert? Wow, this is the most confident bunch of people. You're all liars. There's two introverts in the middle of Times Square. Statistically, at least 45% of you are really scared right now. Actually, 44% because 1% is up here. I'm the biggest introvert I know. I was 21 in the mid 1570s. I was even more scared and even more introverted than I am now. And I learned the hard way really to experience at work that being an introvert and not dealing with your fears is a really bad place to be. I wasn't invited to the meetings that I wanted to go to because I never said anything. I was too scared. People didn't want that silent person in the corner who said nothing. No one implemented my ideas at work because I never told anyone what they were. They lived in my head so they didn't exist. I found out after a couple of years that a male peer of mine who started work at the same time as me was earning a significant amount more money than I was and I felt a little bit aggrieved by this and I couldn't figure out why and I asked him and he said, well I went and asked for more money. Have you asked for more money? And I said, no, because I didn't talk. So I learned very quickly that fear can really hold you back in many different ways and it's not a good place to be. My real epiphany came when I went to a women's leadership conference very similar to this but not in the middle of Times Square, in the middle of London a couple of years later and there was a group of possibly the most high powered female executives. They had great shoes, they had expensive handbags, their hair looked great, not like mine, it wasn't moving all over the place. And they had many wise things to say. And these are really my role models. I thought, I want a successful career. I want to do this thing. What can I learn from these people? And the most theoretically senior person on the stage stood up at one point and was asked a question about um, where did she find her confidence? She was the most confident woman on earth. And she said, I go to work every day thinking I'm going to get found out, that I'm not good enough at this job that my colleagues and they think, hang on a sec, she's, she's faking it. She's not qualified to be here. She said, I feel that every day. I'm driven by insecurity. And as soon as she said that, every other head in the audience started nodding empathically. And I realized that not only was being scared of pretty much everything holding me back, but I wasn't alone. A lot of people out there are introverts, not in Times Square, clearly there's three of us. Um, but a lot of people out there are introverts, they're scared to speak up, they're scared to put themselves out there, and that's normal, and it's okay to live with fear. It's not okay to just sit there and wallow in it. I mean, you have to do something about it and channel it, but just know that you're not alone, and if you do have insecure people on your team, if you have people who you feel are holding back, help them come out of their shell, because you have no idea the amazing ideas that are in their head that you can help unlock. I worked out after I saw these amazing, confident women who apparently weren't as confident as they made themselves out to be, I thought, well, what am I scared of? Fear is driven by something. And I realized that I was scared of failure. I've got a pretty badass Asian mother. She doesn't really like B grades. Um, I have a fairly tough family. We don't really deal with insecurity, vulnerability, and failure terribly well. 
Um, but it's odd because as a society, in theory, we often celebrate failure. Um, Vinod Kuzla, who's the founder of Sun Microsystems, is a famous and proud failure, and he says a lot. I would challenge anyone to point to as many failures as I've had in my career. Unless you're failing, you're not innovating. Winston Churchill, one of my heroes, obviously, said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And here is your trivia question, and I will stake a ticket to the Harlem Globetrotters on it if you can catch me before I run back to Penn Station. Who was the, possibly one of the most famous failures in the state? Failed postmaster, bankrupted general store manager, failed, the, failed, he ran for Congress and failed, he ran for Senate and failed, he was jilted by the first woman that he loved, who consequently, unfortunately, went on to die. Um, he couldn't find a general to fight his wars for him for the first two years. And Abraham Lincoln went on to be possibly one of the greatest presidents of the United States. So whether you're talking about Churchill, whether you're talking about Lincoln, whether you're talking about luminaries in business, if you've got friends on Facebook who are the kind of people who love sharing memes about inspiration is inspiration and you're not failing unless you're really great and all of that sort of rubbish, you'll see that as a society in the abstract we often celebrate failure. And every business book you read is going to say the same thing. Fail bravely, fail wonderfully. But if, like me, you've ever stood in front of a board of directors or your CEO to explain your wonderful failure, you're going to feel that the uh, wonderful failure is not quite so wonderful in their eyes and that's not really what they're looking for. So there's this dichotomy of failure is to be celebrated and to be accepted and it's inevitable, but you're not allowed to do it yourself in business. What do you do about that? I think the main thing to do about it is to know what a successful failure looks like. If you can spot a successful failure, you're going to be fine. So I've got two stories, quick stories to tell you. One is about a successful failure of mine, one is an unsuccessful. The unsuccessful failure was a TV program that I worked on at MTV Networks a few years ago, just up the road. It was about two Canadian teenagers who skied during the day and discovered, were detectives and discovered adventures in their hometown at night. We put most of our annual budget into making the most ambitious commercials imaginable. We sat there talking about, this is going to be like The Sopranos, but we're going to shoot it for $20. The entire team spent a year working on this stuff. We watched the show that night, the commercials looked great, we went to bed happy, obviously not together, um, and we woke up the next day thinking, here come the ratings, and guess what? We got a zero. Now, if anyone's not very good at math, a zero is less than one and more than minus one. It's really difficult to statistically get a zero because what that means is no one in America, and it's a country of 300 million people, watch that show. I'd sunk almost my entire year's money and the efforts of some really talented people into something that, that didn't work. That was a bad failure, not because it didn't work, but because we couldn't figure out why it didn't work and what we could do about it. I had a good failure a couple of years ago where we launched a new business we missed our revenue goals in the first year, we missed our EBITDA goals. By most metrics it was a failure, but I counted it as a success because we knew what went wrong, how we were going to do better next time, we knew what problems we had to fix, and we knew that we could make a lot of money from it. So failing isn't the thing, it's about learning from your failure, and that's kind of where I did it right, where I did it wrong. If you want to make failure work for you, and actually this works if you're a parent of a teenager and you want some advice on how to deal with your kids, I have three stepsons who are teenagers, this works for teenagers as well as in the business world. Make failure work for you. Three things I've learned. Number one, don't surprise anyone with your failure. Don't surprise your boss or your board. No one wants you to stroll in and go, guess what, I messed up big time and I'm going to tell you about how much money I've spent. Explain what the risk is, get them on board, make sure they know what you're doing and share with them how it went and what you're going to do next. Don't surprise anyone. Plan for failure. If you're going to fail, do it fast. Most people are going to fail at something. We're all going to fail at something, probably today. Do it fast. Know that you failed. In other words, know what success is. Have a plan B and just get on with it. And don't look back. Just keep going. The third thing, which I think is most important, is plan for success. The very worst situation. And you see this a lot in business. Uh, companies who are surprised when something takes off and then don't have the backup to be able to fulfill demand. They don't have the resources in order to continue to grow. So they stall and they stop and they wonder what happened. You know, you're working on a project because you want it to work. So when it works, keep going and make it bigger and better. The last thing I want to talk about is a little bit about taking risks. Because you know you're going to fail. You know that you're secretly scared or three of us are secretly scared. We're going to do it anyway. 
what's the point of taking risks? And the point of taking risks, and it's related to fear and failure, is the payback's going to be just great. When I was a kid, I had three goals. To get my mum to stop cutting my hair, this was when I was 11. When my mum stopped cutting my hair, eventually that worked. I wanted to own a pair of jeans. My mum didn't believe in jeans, but those people exist. Um, and eventually I bought myself a pair of jeans. The third thing was to be MD of a big advertising agency by, J by the age of 30, and this one I failed. And I failed because that was the year that I moved to the States and I took a promotion that I was unqualified for on the West Coast. I took the promotion on the West Coast, and this is big risk because I knew no one in America. If any of you have been to LA, if you can't drive and you live in LA, you have a miserable time, you're walking everywhere and it's a big place. So I couldn't drive, I knew no one. I only really took the job out of revenge because a male colleague told me, well, they're never going to give it to you because you're unqualified. So I thought, well, I won't tell you what I thought, but I went for the job anyway and I got the job. And I found myself 6,000 miles from home, knowing nobody, wondering if I really was qualified for this job, with no friends. I had one friend in the States, and he lived in New York, so he was effectively useless. I was also working in a job that had been created for me, so no one had done it before, so no one knew what to do. I was kind of freaking out about this, and my dad saw me off at Heathrow, which is an airport in London. He said, look, I don't know what you're worried about. If it works out, great, stay there. If it doesn't, get a plane ticket and come home. But what, what is the problem? And I thought, he's right, I'm overthinking this. Risks are never that big. There's no downside. There's always a plan B. The second risk I took was moving from LA to New York to work at MTV Networks. For a startup in kids' media, it was internet-based. I knew nothing about any of the above. I had no experience. But I did have experience marketing to kids, and I thought the people were great. And the big thing I'm going to say is, if you're taking a risk, always bet on the people. Work with smart people, and you're going to be fine. I moved, it worked out, I got like $500 to spend in Ikea in New Jersey to furnish a flat in Manhattan, which as you know goes nowhere, um, and it all worked out fine. So take the risk. The third risk I took was moving to the Harlem Globetrotters, professional risk. You know, you can see, I'm not a basketball player, I know nothing, but I realized very quickly that they weren't hiring me to play basketball, that's what they do and they do it great. They're hiring me because I could connect with moms and kids and get the message out there. So don't overthink a risk. Trust your gut, go for good people, and you'll be fine. If you're feeling scared, you're not the only person, just live through it, fake confidence if necessary, and it will not be as bad as you think. And if you're worried about failure, there's no need to worry about it, because we all pay taxes, we're all going to die, and we're all going to fail. You will fail, have a plan B, and you're going to be just fine.